Hey everybody, uh, reanimator of Man in Black Reviews here, and joining me tonight is Mizzy L. Hello. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Game of Thrones, if the title hasn't already given that away. Uh, since season two is going to be premiering on HBO uh, this April, we thought we'd uh, usher it in by looking back at season one, just talking about uh, characters, uh, comparing it to the book, predictions, you know the drill. Luckily, right, so the April 1st date is not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, let's start things off. Uh, what do you think uh, was, like, what do you think made this thing so big? Like, what do you think uh, was its main appeal? Well, I mean, people like a good fantasy story, especially one that's a bit more gritty than other fluffier type things, and I think you're going to definitely get that with a show on HBO, since I don't know how many HBO shows you've seen, but a lot of them are pretty gritty like this. So that mixed with sort of fantasy magical type setting, even though there actually isn't that much magic to speak of when I think about it, but... Yeah, the, the fantasy elements are definitely really uh, downplayed, for the most part. But yeah, it's like real fantasy, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense, but I mean... Of course, it being a pre-existing, really popular book series, it definitely helps. Because I had heard of the Sun and Ice and Fire series many times before the show. I just never really gave it much of a thought. It was on my giant list of books to eventually read, because it sounds decent. But I never really gave any thought to it, even though I knew it was really popular. So, I think a built-in audience, plus the backing of HBO, plus just quality and something that catches on with people really combined to just make this really popular. Yeah, most definitely. I don't have HBO, so I was kind of late to the party. I didn't get to uh I didn't get to watch the show until much later, but uh I started reading uh the books uh not too long ago, long ago, and I what really drew me in was uh like you said before, it's not that it's not like uh other fantasies like say Lord of the Rings or or the King Arthur series or anything like that. I mean, I mean, when you think of it, you think it might be like about wizards fighting dragons, but it's more like political intrigue and, uh, mm -hmm. and sexual escapades. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's fantasy, and technically it's not a, an extremely unique fantasy setting. I think I may have mentioned this in my review of the book, but at the same time, the way they handle everything, what sort of plot twist they put in, it makes it unique. Yeah. I'd say it's more like uh I'd say it's more like a Shakespearean historical play than something by Tolkien. Mm hmm Yeah. Cause there aren't any like giant epic huge battles that are unrealistic like um like in Lord of the Rings and all those mm -hmm. types of things. All the battles, once again, are really realistic. So yeah, and you don't even get to see any mythical creatures, and like you don't see the dragons until like the last two minutes of the movie, which yeah, is I mean, the most pretty much things in which is pretty much the only thing that reminds you it's uh, it's a fantasy. Yeah, the most mythical and magical things in this series are the dragons and then the um, White Walkers. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there's really not much to speak of. Yeah, the fantastical elements aren't really the thing that draw people in. I mean, what pe what draws people in, like I said, are all the twists, all the plotting, and uh, how the characters all interact with each other. And uh, it's not very black and white. There's like a lot of gray areas with uh, many of these characters. Like, there's like there'll be one character you hate at the beginning of the series, but by the end he'll completely change your mind, or vice versa. And it's very hard to tell. Uh, Whose side are you you're on? Uh, because uh, uh, because it switches sides so many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the characters that comes to mind when you say that is even though she's horrible throughout ninety five percent of the series and book is Sansa. Because yeah, I mean even though she's a horrible character, she's like the me teenage mean girl version of her universe. Uh, I definitely noticed, like, at the end of the series and the book, like, 
with Joffrey in particular, she really has these second thoughts out of the things. And one scene in particular I remember that really showcased that was when Joffrey, after he takes her to see, um, and just as a warning to everyone, we we probably will be saying spoilers, but we we'll probably be yeah. We might as well just uh, yeah. We might as well just say it now. Well, Heavy we spoilers, can't promise anything. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but after Joffrey takes her out to, uh, you know, force her to look at Ned's severed head on the post, and that's about as big of a spoiler as you can get, um, <laughs> she... We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the ending later. I, I do want to talk about that. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, she just sort of looks at him when he has that bitchy little smirk on his face, and you can tell that she wants to just push him over the edge, even if she has to kill herself to do it. Yes, when I when I saw that, I was like, yes, yes, do it! Get rid of that little turd! Kill him! Finally, you're starting to see some sort of sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, uh, yeah, Sansa is definitely a perfect example of that. I mean, I remember reading uh, throughout the book whenever her chapters were more or less my uh, least favorites uh, because, uh, she... okay. It's just so annoying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but what you have to keep in mind is that she's a young girl. Like, uh, she's 13 in the series, but in the books, she's 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, and she's at that age where uh, where girls do have these uh, romantic thoughts of, uh, like, of some handsome prince coming to sweep her off her feet. But, uh, but reality hits her pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and since I uh, finished reading the second book, uh, I really start feeling feeling bad for Sansa cuz uh cuz I think she's one of the characters that uh suffered the most because uh well not only are her like dreams completely destroyed and her family is torn apart but she's at the mercy of this like this horrible despicable person who you just want to wring your neck until <laughs> It's like I, this I twisted, just got evil version of Prince Charming that you just want to punch until he's his face is mush. <laughs> yes, I mean, every time, uh, every time Joffrey appeared on screen, I was just like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> and I was just like flipping off the screen so hard. But you know, his actor is great because, oh my god, he's aced the whole just evil ugh, thing so much. Yeah. <laughs> he even just looks like an annoying little twerp. <laughs> yeah, I mean. uh... Yeah, the entire the entire cast was uh, was nearly perfect. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I uh, mean uh, Peter Dinklage. Oh my god, he deserves yes, that, uh, that Emmy. He really oh does. definitely. I guess it's true what they say: the Lannisters really do shit gold. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, uh, Tyrion is definitely my favorite character in the series uh, so far. He's definitely I, I mean, my second favorite. I don't know. Danny is pretty awesome, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about Danny later. But uh, but uh, yeah, Tyrion is uh, definitely at the top. Uh, I mean, he is a Lannister, and most of the Lannisters are pretty much horrible people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, and even though he's not the nicest of guys, he's definitely the most likable. He's definitely the most human amongst them. Oh yeah. And uh, it's still one of my favorite scenes of the whole series is when he slaps Joffrey a few times. Oh my god, I loved that. <laughs> I could watch that for hours. <laughs> I think there's a video on YouTube of it just like playing that over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has heard our prayers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh Yeah, I mean he's def I mean he's not really the, the nicest of people, but he is is definitely the uh, the most relatable. He's one of the smartest people, if if not the smartest. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, like. I mean, he was able to. I mean, he was able to trick himself out of uh, out of imprisonment. He was able to uh, buy an entire uh, tribe of uh, an entire tribe of bandits to uh, as his own personal army. I, I mean, basically, he it sums up. His whole thing, what he said to uh, John at one point, fairly early in the series, I think, while... Why am I blanking on his brother's name? Uh, Jamie. Jamie. There we go. While Jamie relies on his looks to get him by, 
Tyrion relies on his wits and his smarts. So, mm-hmm. yeah, de- definitely. And I uh, think it is his size that has made him so human compared to uh, his family. Yeah. All right. Just about the characters in general, there. Uh, it's pretty easy to determine uh, uh, who you, who you like and who you don't like. Like uh, on uh, like on one side, like my favorite characters are uh, are Tyrion, Arya, John, Daenerys, uh, Ned, uh, Bran. But the characters I absolutely hate are the uh, are characters like uh, Viserys, Cersei, Joffrey. Uh, Sorry about that text noise. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Littlefinger, Varys. Well, I don't really hate them, but uh, we'll get to them later. But uh, and I'm and there so are some. I'm sure about Littlefinger for the longest time. It's like they were trying to make him into a bad guy so much, like so obvious that he was that they almost made that. I I almost thought that he wasn't just because they were trying to make it so obvious. So it's like they did a double twist type thing. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, that does bring up a pretty good question. Who do you think is the most powerful person in the in the show? Hmm. Like, I mean, the show in general is all about uh, power and the struggle for it, and uh, and what people will do to attain it and keep hold of it. And uh, there, I think, there... honestly, the first person who comes to mind is Varys. Yes, because, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's not any of the Lannisters. They think they're in charge. They think they have the most power. But it's really the people under them who watch everything, who really control all the behind-the-scenes stuff. They don't want to think about that. But really, if these guys wanted them to fall, they would. So Yeah. I was just going to say, there are different people who uh, have different uh, different types of power. Like, Robert is the, is the king. Uh, Ned is the hand of the king, which basically makes him the second most powerful person in the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I mean, Tywin Lannister is the richest person in the in the kingdom. And then there are people like Littlefinger and Varys, who uh, who have spies all over the all over the place, and uh, always seem to be like three steps ahead of everybody. Yeah, I mean, those are the guys that people like the Lannisters should really watch out for. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, they my... thought Ned was a threat, and yeah, sure he was, but at least they knew what they were getting with Ned. Yeah, I mean, uh, like one of my favorite scenes in the series uh, was uh, the first scene that Littlefinger and Varys had alone when they're in the throne room after a council, and they're just they're just partaking in this epic battle of words. Like they're always like trying to underhand the other one, but. The other one always seems to be one step ahead. Mm-hmm. Like one of my favorite, uh, like at the end of it, when uh, when Renly inter- interrupts them to come to a council, uh, Var says, "There was a tragic accident. Have you heard?" And I, I just love that line because he was just saying, eh, eh, "I'm always one step ahead of you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, Varys is. <laughs> He's definitely one powerful dude. <laughs> I actually have a very uh, interesting theory on him, and I think I've told you this before. Oh, yeah, you have. Yeah. yeah. I think Varys might be a Targaryen. Hmm. Now, what exactly makes you think that again? Because, remember, I haven't actually read Clash of Kings. I know, I know, guys, I want to. Well, I'm not uh... Sure if I will soon. <laughs> well, uh... The main reason I think that is because uh, you never really know how much he says is the truth and how much is just fabricated. Because he says he has eyes all over the place. And uh, he never says who his allegiance is to. I mean, he says that he's from the free cities. uh, But there there isn't really that much hard evidence of that. At at least not yet. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure there is some some evidence further down. But... uh, we're not getting into that. <laughs> but, like, I mean... So we don't know who his allegiance really is to. What does it have to do with him being potentially a Targaryen? I don't know exactly, but... Uh, if that did actually happen to be the case, uh, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest. Hmm. 
And well, this I mean, is kind I wouldn't surpri- I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of twist like that involving his character. In fact, I'm expecting something like that. So Yeah. And I know this is kind of a shallow thing to to judge on, but what I've noticed is a lot of uh people who came for the Targaryen family, their names end in R Y S. Uh I know that I sound like a conspiracy nut saying that, but it's the best I got. <laughs> Actually, I hadn't thought about that, but, yeah. Yeah. Yep. You definitely want to keep your eyes peeled on that one. So, you know, one thing, and this is, I guess, more speculation about the series as a whole, but I remember reading about this before. It, it was a theory, basically, on who John's parents were. Do you think Ned really is his father? Actually, uh, there, I've heard about that, too, and uh, there has been some uh, speculation. Like, I heard that so far in the series, uh, uh, George R. R. Martin hasn't revealed who his parents are. I know uh, there's one really, really um, big rumor about who specifically, though. Yeah, I heard that, too. Uh, I heard a lot of people think that uh, Ned's sister is his, uh, is his mother. Mm. Is that what you were thinking of? Yeah, Ned's sister and, uh, do you know who else? Uh, I think it was, uh, one of the Targaryens, uh, Daenerys' yeah. older brother, uh, mm-hmm. not Viserys, the other one. Yeah. So that yeah, would I, mean that John was both a Stark and a Targaryen. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna kill yeah. everyone because of his badassness. <laughs> Good thing he's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, if that was the case, I wonder how Danny would react to that. Like, I mean, would she try to, like, would she try to get him on her side if, in the very, very distant future, since I, since, what, there were six books out now, I think? I think the sixth Five. one, oh, okay, I think the fifth one then just came out not too long ago. So mm-hmm. it'll be a while before we ever actually get to this point in the series. But, yeah. like, um... I have to wonder if they ever met Danny and John, and this was the case, and she found that out somehow. I wonder how she would react to it if she would try to get him on her side or, like, try to kill him. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Because hmm. Danny's a very interesting character. I mean, you don't know exactly what you're going to get with her. Like I said, she's my favorite, but I've heard that she definitely goes through changes, I guess. Yeah, like I think uh, in the first book, in the first book slash uh, slash season, uh, uh, she's definitely the character who gets the most development. Like uh, at the beginning of the books, she's like this very uh, she's this very shy girl who's like under her brother's uh, psychological grip. But when she becomes married to uh, Cal Drogo and she becomes accepted by uh, the Dothraki people, she starts to. Uh, Gain her confidence and starts. I love uh, her transition into these. Into yeah, and she starts life. asserting herself to a, a position of power, like yeah, something her, that she never had before. Her development is just so awesome. She turns into such this badass character when before she was like basically just this timid little girl. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just great how she really fell in with the. Um... Now I'm blanking on the name you just said. <laughs> Cal Drogo. <laughs> No, no, I mean, like, the oh. actual... Oh, you mean, uh, what are you talking about? Cal Drogo's whole group, like that. The Dothraki. Yeah. God, why am I blanking on names? I really should have seen highlights of this before we did this. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, she really falls in with the Dothraki pretty quickly. I mean, at first, sure, she's scared, but when she gets into it, she gets into it. <laughs> yeah, and... And it's kind of the opposite of uh, of what happened with Viserys. Like when uh, Viserys married her to Khal Drogo, he was hoping to uh, to get his own army so he can uh, reconquer Westeros. But he ended up going like down to the bottom of the totem pole. And I mean, I hated Viserys uh, when I first saw him, but as time went on, I just I just started thinking that he's uh, I think he's more pitiful than uh, than he is uh, fearful. I mean. I mean, yeah, I mean, he definitely was not, like, 
definitely not someone to be intimidated by at all as the season goes on. But, I mean, I still hated him, though. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I mean, I'm still I glad when he died. <laughs> yeah, best death ever. Oh my god, I know. He so had it coming. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean, basically, Viserys is someone who thinks he has power, but he doesn't. And, uh, he, uh, he just gets really mad, and he's just... And when he loses his temper, it... He thinks he's uh, trying to to be dominant, but really he just makes himself sound more and more like a spoiled child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's just making himself out to be even more of a joke than he already is. And, I mean, I seem to recall, like, right before he dies, the Dothraki are basically laughing at him. So, no one takes I mean, they... him seriously anymore. Yeah, and when uh, he finally did die, uh, Viserys did uh, realize uh, how much of an idiot he was and started to realize that he, he couldn't lead ants to a picnic, let alone re lead an army of 10,000 Dothraki warriors. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it definitely made sense that he was, like, the first player in the game to lose, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he thought he would be king. Mm-hmm. Well, here's your crown, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, something I've noticed uh, about this is a lot of characters, uh, like, you either like them or hate them at first, but then your opinion sort of uh, slowly changes as the series go. Like, I think we, uh, one character I'm kind of gray about is, uh, is Catelyn, uh, Ned Stark's wife. See, I like, like her, except for she's such a bitch to John when he doesn't deserve it. I hate that. I mean, I mean, me too. I'm, and that's not that's not the only thing. I mean, uh, my problem is uh, she kind of uh, messes things up more than she uh, more than she helps. Like, I think that uh, her capturing Tyrion uh, was pretty much the whole start of the whole war. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. God, what was she thinking with that? I mean, that was such an impulsive, irresponsible decision on her part. And you would think that someone of her position, knowing everything she does, having the experience she does, would be able to think something like that through more than she did, but I guess not. Yeah, I mean, that's the perfect word to, uh, uh, to describe her, impulsive. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, everything she uh, does, she does for... Uh, for her family and for her her heritage and uh she has uh good intentions but uh sometimes uh she seems to be uh blinded by her emotions mm -hmm. and she does end up uh making some uh stupid decisions because of because of it like uh capturing Tyrion and taking her to uh taking him to the airy mm -hmm. and uh psycho ass sister oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh my god, that was like creepy at times, like, oh, when she was nursing yeah. her son, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I, I'm surprised they actually left that in. <laughs> actually, I'm surprised there was a lot of things they left in. <laughs> like I said, it's HBO, so they're gonna leave a decent amount of stuff in, but like... I guess the, one of the major things they changed was the ages of all the characters, which makes sense because, I mean, I don't think people would really stand for 10 and 11 year olds doing this sort of stuff. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, I think the only uh, really uh, major age changes in the cast were the children. And even though they only bumped them up like two or three years. Uh, sometimes more than that. I'd say sometimes five years, because wasn't Danny like, 13 at the start of the book? Yeah. And she's, she, it looks like she's, like, 18 or 19 in the show. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't I just think like... people would really want to see a 13-year-old girl go through what Danny goes through. Oh, no. I, I just want to say this uh, right out. Amelia Clark, the uh, actress who plays Daenerys... One of the single most hottest women I have ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, she was. Gosh, she was really beautiful. Yeah, I wouldn't mind letting her wake my dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I had to. 
I had to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Amelia Clark, if you're listening to this, marry me. <laughs> yeah. All right, back on topic. <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, the uh, the age cha- in my opinion, the uh, age changes weren't that drastic. No, or they, they don't all really- made sense and they worked really well. So, mm-hmm. I don't mind it at all. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I don't and, know what the reaction to that was uh, from, like, the really hardcore fan base of the books that loved the books before the series ever came out. But I can't imagine they had to complain too much, just because, I mean, also with older actors and actresses, you get more competent people, so. Yeah. I mean, they but they were good actors, so I, I could really care less uh, uh, what age they were, as long as they weren't, like... 15 or something. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, they sold... Everyone sold their roles perfectly, so Mm -hmm. I don't care about the age differences at all. It fit, and they sort of had to do it, so... All right, let's uh, talk about some uh, differences uh, between uh, the book and the movie. I mean, there aren't that much to uh, talk about because uh, they follow this, like, really, really close. I have to say, this is one of the best adaptations I've ever seen, honestly. Because I read the book after I watched the first season, and they were so similar. It's great how faithful they were to the book. I love that. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think they might have had, like, the book as a reference manual on, like, on, like, every set and every, uh, and every shooting. Like, they just had the book on standby to make sure they got everything right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh... And the stuff they added into the season still fit really well like um just really minor scenes for the most part just dialogue between people like little finger and some of his guys and uh cersei and jamie stuff like that but it, even though the those scenes weren't in the book they still fit really well so yeah I'm, i mean uh and they are definitely most uh really plausible like in the book you have like seven or eight pov characters and all the scenes that they did add were uh, scenes where none of those characters were present, and they were uh, definitely building on their characters. So you def- you got to see uh, you got to see some scenes with uh, Jamie, with Robert, with Cersei, with uh, Littlefinger, mm-hmm. and you got to see their char- characters uh, get a bit more development. Like uh, one of my favorite scenes in the entire series was the scene uh, was the scene between Robert and Cersei where they were talking alone. Perfect example. That was a great scene. Yeah, and it kind of makes you uh, like how the book would be different if one of those characters did become POVs. Like, I always wonder like what Robert's chapters would be like. Hmm. Yeah, and I always kind of wanted some Cersei chapters, but then again, I guess that sort of would have spoiled some stuff, like the whole twin zest thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we we would have figured that out. Uh, we would have figured that out anyway. No, true. But uh, we did get to see some uh, scenes like, like when you're when you're reading the book, you're you do wonder th- some stuff like what did happen uh, when Robert went out hunting. And about Robert, uh, I mean, I've talked about characters uh, that uh, whose uh, whose characters are a bit kind of gray, and uh, Robert is, I think, is another good example of that because. I mean, everybody talks about, like, what a great king he was and, like, how much of a badass he was when he was uh, younger. But when you do finally see him in the king in the kingdom uh, sitting on the throne, you see that he's kind of, uh, that he's just kind of a, a big oaf who he's has... not uh, so much of a badass anymore. Yeah, I mean, they do build him up to be, like, this great badass, but you see that he's, uh, that he isn't that great. He's just kind of a... a Fat alcoholic slop. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he's sort of a waste that everyone under him definitely can control and use. But I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. I'm kind of conflicted on Robert. Like in the beginning of the series, I kind of liked him, but as time went on, he was just I don't know, disgusting enough and stupid enough sometimes that it was just irritating. Like, yeah. I mean that one thing that comes to mind is. Um, 
the whole segment where Arya gets into the fight with Joffrey and then the wolves are killed. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, it's kind of ridiculous for Robert to have one of the wolves, and not even the wolf that did it, killed. And then agree to it just because Cersei was so demanding. I mean, I guess that makes sense, but that still irritated me. Yeah, and that was that's kind of like what I was talking about when I asked what the who the most powerful character was because uh, even though Robert may be the king, he is under the influence of other people. Like he's un- oh yeah, he's, I mean Robert he's didn't under- even come to mind when he said that because he's really not when you think about. It. Sure, he's the king, but other people have more power. He's not in control. <laughs> yeah, and he is always like under the influence of other people. Like, he's under uh, the grip of Cersei. He's uh, kind of conflicted about uh, about his friendship with Ned. And uh, and kind of like Viserys, whenever he tries to assert his power, he uh, he just comes across as silly instead. Mm-hmm. There you go. Just a fat alcoholic who no one takes seriously. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the characters uh, said uh, he's really good at winning thrones, but he doesn't know how to rule one. Hmm. Or something along those lines. Well, that definitely makes sense. So, I think we should probably talk about Ned a bit because he is technically the main character. <laughs> yeah. Man, killing him off. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, I kind of knew that uh, Ned was going to be be killed uh, even before I read the book or saw the series. Uh, I mean, at the time, I thought it was like one of those endings that everybody knew, like Snape's kills Dumbledore, or one of those kinds of endings. But uh, in the context, uh, in the, I mean, technically, it is a big spoiler, but in context, you don't know the events that led up to him being beheaded, or uh, or what he did, or what he discovered. And a lot, of, one of the things that a lot of people say is that uh, his down his downfall was that he was too honorable. Like, he trusted people too much. He was too uh, bound by honor to do the thing that would be best for the kingdom or for others. Yeah, like, I mean, one of the really... The, Ned was a great character, and he was really honorable, a good guy all around, but sometimes he was really stupid. I mean, yeah. Littlefinger. Littlefinger tells you not to trust him. What do you do? And you trust him you anyway. Trust him. <laughs> what the hell, I mean, man? Jesus. When someone tells you not to trust them, don't trust them. <laughs> yeah. When you have I... really, really important information about the son of, or the supposed son of the king and his wife, and actually find out that it's the son of the wife and her twin, don't tell her you know this and give her warning. Just yeah. reveal the secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think he was dead as soon as that happened. Yeah. Like, I mean, when I saw that scene, I was like, no, man. Oh, you're going to give Cersei no. Lannister warning. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you're dealing with the fucking Lannisters, man. <laughs> They're going to kill you. Yeah. But still, I mean, I think... No one expected him to actually die just because he was being built up as the main character. Even with the series, too, because, like, it was Sean Bean playing him, who yeah. is definitely one of the. I think he is the most. He was the most famous guy in season one, unless there was another major actor that I'm not thinking about, but I'm pretty sure uh. he was the most notable one. Yeah, I think the only ones I can really think of who were really noteworthy were Sean Bean and uh, Peter Dinklage. Yeah, and I think Sean Bean is definitely, at least before, more popular than Peter Dinklage. So, no one, even just because of that, no one actually expected him to die just, like, in the first season. So that was a pretty big surprise. I remember finding it funny because right after that happened, like, so many people, countless people posted on the Game of Thrones Facebook page like, I'm not watching the show again! Where is it gonna go now? How dare you! <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing that makes it so great. You don't know what's gonna happen. And it shows that the good guys don't always win. Exactly. That makes it, once again, like what we were talking about earlier, even more realistic. Because, I mean, in fa- in your usual because... generic fantasy setting, 
you usually have the bad, not, not the bad guys winning, the good guys always winning is what I meant to say. But just because of that alone, you definitely know that's not going to be the case with this series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, him and the death of Cal Drogo were definitely uh, warnings for what's going to be ahead. Like, don't know what you're, don't think you know what's going to happen next, because you don't. <laughs> Cal Drogo. Cal Drogo? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I thought he was a he was a pretty badass character. I mean, he's a, I mean, he's the ruler of this whole tribe of, uh, for less of a better better word, savages. And I mean, everybody thinks they're savage people, but uh, they uh, they do have their culture of their own, and uh, they have their own way of doing things. And uh, when Daenerys uh, first marries him. him uh, he's like completely afraid of him, but then he turns out to actually be a nice guy and uh, and treats her with a lot more respect than uh, Viserys ever did. Yeah, I mean that was even evident like right after they got married during the scene where he takes her off to like the beach, and even though he can basically just kick her onto the ground and just rape her on the spot, he instead just like sort of gently unfolds her arms and tries to be gentle with her so that because he knows she's scared. That was the first sign I saw of him not being like just a totally evil character. Yeah. And he is a very powerful in his own right. Like like I said before, he rules a tribe of over 10,000 warriors. He's like and he's the father of the uh of the stallion that will mount the world. Mm-hmm. And and I think the most disappointing thing about his death was the way he died like he died from an infected wound i know and then like he was sort of alive after that but just a shell literally a shell yeah nothing inside that because i actually he was so badass in fact he and it's like he and daddy as a whole were sort of my favorite characters just because they as a couple i found so cool so i was really disappointed when he died but I mean, yeah, the way he died. It's like, someone like him, you want to go out in a glorious, bloody battle, not as a husk. Yeah, and the another thing, uh, the way he died, like, uh, like, he tried to get this, uh, this witch to, uh, save her, save him using this, uh, blood magic, and it's one of the only times we ever see anything fantastical in the series, and it ends up turning one of our favorite characters into a vegetable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, everybody dies. Spoiler. <laughs> Pretty Everybody much. dies. Bad, good, they all die. <laughs> Eventually. But yeah, I, I think I've heard also that by the fifth book that just came out, there are literally only a few characters of the cast left. I mean, yeah. just because George R. R. Martin is basically a serial killer, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's Arya like... better not die, though. I swear to God, she better not die. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, that that would really suck. If, if either she or Tyrion died, I would be really upset. <laughs> or Danny, I will rage all over the internet if any of them die. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will cower in their holes for Mopal's wrath. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Danny's, um... Well, I don't know. Assistant isn't really a right, the right word, but... The guy who went with both her and uh, Viserys, who is sort of her guardian now. He's oh, definitely uh, in love Jorah. With her. Jorah. Yeah. He's definitely in love with her. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you mind if I just say it, uh... Just out of context, he is. Mm. It, it, it's confirmed in the second book. Yeah. Well, I mean, not I, a bit... do, I don't even really get to know a spoiler, just because it's so obvious in the first season and book that, like, yeah. Yeah, and and he was actually, like, uh, wasn't he, like, a spy for uh, Robert or Varys or one of those people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and he was right sent... Idea. Yeah, and he was actually, like, sent out to kill her, but, uh, but he ended up, uh... He ended up he falling in love. do it. Because yeah. he loves her. Oh. Yes. It would. I mean, it's kind of like uh, it's like the Huntsman falling in love with Snow White. Mm-hmm. Kind yeah. Of. But I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up like sacrificing himself for her at some point or something. 
Uh, nothing like that has happened yet, but, uh... Hmm. Alright, so, uh... What do you think's gonna happen in Season 2? Uh, I don't know. I mean, they're just... It's so hard to speculate on a season... Not a season, a series like this, because, I mean, even just seeing things like with Ned, it can really go anywhere at all, but... Yeah, I mean, I already know what's going to happen, but, uh, (laughs) but I'll, I'll try to keep it as uh, vague as I can. Mm. All right, here's the, here's a rundown of, like, where everybody is. Uh, uh, Catelyn is in, uh, is in River Run with Rob. Uh, Tyrion is, uh, going to be the, the new Hand of the King in Tywin's place. Uh, Sansa is in, is in, uh, is in King's Landing. Uh, Daenerys, uh, has her dragons now. And, uh... Badass. Yeah. God, they and, really uh, could not have ended the season any better. <laughs> yeah. And now we have, like, five people who were, uh... who were laying claim to the throne. Like, uh... Like, we know that Rob's brother, uh, Renly, is, uh... is calling himself the new king, but there's also his brother, Stannis, who we, uh... who we never see in the first season, but... Don't worry, you'll definitely see him uh, then. Hmm. Now, I have a feeling that Danny's story is not actually going to connect with the main one in the second book. Maybe at the very end, but not in a major way. That will probably be later in the series. But, of course, I know it's difficult for you to respond to anything I say just because you've read everything, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I want I want to say everything, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but the, for the sake of not spoiling it for you, I'm... I'm trying to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> oh, hey, second season in book podcast. <laughs> yeah, tune in. Uh, yeah, tune in a couple months when we'll uh, go over that. Yeah. All right, but I will tell you uh, a little bit of what's going to be happening. Uh, there's going to be a lot of buildup for the second uh, uh, for the uh, second season finale, like. There is a big event that happens at the end of season two. Uh, not just one in character, but for everybody. Everybody uh, kind of gets a big twist ending. Yeah. And it it all seems like a uh, build-up. Like, you don't know where it's going to go, but it does all kind of uh, culminate together. Interesting. I guess it doesn't surprise me that there is a, a big event, though, just because it's... I mean, that's how it was for the first book, so... Yeah. I mean, for the most part, uh, uh, not a lot has, uh, not a lot has changed. Like, uh, like, there's still twists and turns, there's, uh, still a lot of plotting and backstabbing. Joffrey is still a bag of dicks. But I don't think we... He's still awesome. Yes. Arya's still a badass. John still... I I have a feeling the second book is just mainly, like, a build-up to book three because book three I've heard is where just a crap load of or at least one thing in particular that's just huge happens oh yes yes there is a huge thing that happens in book three that like changes everything Mm -hmm. like like you thought that uh Ned Stark's death was drastic you wait till season three (laughs) Or wait till you read Storm of Swords. I've actually heard that they might split up the third book into two seasons, just because there's so much. Yeah, like I said before, the third book is like a thousand pages long. Mm. I mean, I think they'd have to. Well, I definitely wouldn't complain, because then, I mean, uh, it would suck for them to have to start cutting out a lot of stuff. Because it's amazing how much they kept in with how big Game of Thrones was. So, hell, if they can fit in more, why not? I know they want to keep each season to ten episodes, though, just because they want to stick with the quality versus quantity thing, which I also like. Yeah, I mean, and since each episode is an hour long, I don't, I don't see why that would be too much of a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's I don't a know. It's short, and with how much I like it, I wouldn't complain if there were more episodes. But hey, if that means I'm sacrificing quality, then I'd rather not. So. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if you know this, but uh, 
the fourth and the fifth books, uh, Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons, they happen simultaneously. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I remember yeah, that. Like, yeah, like the fourth book only focuses on what's happening in the Seven Kingdoms, and uh, the fifth book only focuses on uh, what's happening north of the Wall and uh, and in the East. Hmm. Interesting. That I mean, that explains why I've heard so-so things about the fifth book. I guess maybe because it just doesn't progress the story that terribly much with them happening at the same time, so... Yeah, and I think it, and I think the the reason uh this has happened is because uh uh when Martin originally wrote the series he intended it for for it to be a trilogy, but he had so much that he wanted to put in there that he had no choice but to make multiple books and and at the point he was at then he had to divide it into two books, one happening in the Seven Kingdoms and one happening north of the wall and and to the east. But uh and uh, I think with the fifth book, he was like under a lot of pressure to uh, get it done quickly because he kept delaying the uh, the due date. Because when the first book, three books came out, they were at a pretty st- steady rate. They only came out like two years af- after each other. But uh, it took like five or six years for Feast of Feast of Crows to come out, and then it took five years for Dance of Dragons to come out. And now with the series coming out, I think he's up under even more pressure to just get the series done so uh, so the series doesn't end up being ahead of him. That's the thing. What happens if the series does get ahead of the books? That would really suck. Yeah. I mean... And there's a possibility of that happening with how long of a gap there is between the recent books. Yeah, and... I mean, it has happened before. I mean, look what happened with Naruto. I mean, the anime went ahead of the manga and they ended up having like 60 episodes of filler. But I don't think they're going to let that happen. Yeah. I mean, I know. I think he's already, well, not a decent way through, but he's written some, definitely, because I know that he already released one chapter from the sixth book onto his blog. So. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I mean, since they're already dividing uh, the, the third book into two seasons, I think. Uh, I think they're giving it plenty of time to catch up. Yeah, probably. Yeah. All right, so final verdict. Uh, read the books. Buy the show on DVD. Definitely. Just Immediately. Just, yeah, watch it now. Because I commend DVD, you. The DVDs are out now for the first season, so you have no excuse. <laughs> yeah, and season two is coming out in like three weeks, so you better haul ass. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's about all we got. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, us babbling on about a, about a silly show. And, uh, so long, everyone. Yeah. Watch Game of Thrones Season 2, April 1st on HBO. 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 April 1st on HBO.